Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on philanthropy for mental health organized by Alliance in partnership with Strong Minds. Uh, my name is Andrew Milner. I'm a freelance writer and researcher and I'm also the features editor of Alliance as you can probably see from the caption. I'll be the moderator for today's discussion. Um, the discussion also heralds the launch of the March issue of Alliance magazine which has a special feature on philanthropy for mental health and we're delighted to have with us today some of the contributors to that special feature on the panel. But before we hear from them, just let me say a brief word about the format for this event and make one or two announcements. We're going to run for an hour. Each of the panelists will make a short presentation and then we'll have a question and answer session, which we invite all of you to take part in. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can do so anytime by using the chat function on the right hand side of your screen. If you look across on the right, you'll see a, a, a row of little icons and chat is near the top. Click on that and then you can open the window and start typing. It's very straightforward. I'm sure we're all very used to that sort of thing now. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on the on this throughout the event and selecting questions to put to the panelists during the Q&A. Uh, if and when you ask a question, please tell us who you are and where you're from. Uh, obviously, now is not a long time, but we'll do, as be do our best to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, and apologies in advance if we don't get to your question. You can also join the conversation on Twitter if you wish to, uh, at Alliance Mag. Uh, using hashtag mental health philanthropy. Uh, also today we've got not one but two offers. Uh, everyone joining today also qualifies for a 20% discount on subscriptions to Alliance magazine, which includes of course the current March issue. So to get your 20% discount, you'll see again on the right hand side of your screen the offers button. Again, type that, click on that and just follow the prompts. The second offer, <laughs> slightly confusingly, is accessed in a different way. Uh, to celebrate International Women's Day today, we're also offering free print copies of our Feminist Philanthropy issue. If you want to order a free copy, that's not through the offer button. Uh, you'll, after the event, you'll, you'll get a, a follow-up email and you'll find a link in the email with information on how to, how to access that order. So that's two separate ways of getting the offers, just for, for confusion. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, as I mentioned at the start, with this event, we're also partnering with mental health charity Strong Minds, which brings mental health services to the doorstep of African communities by providing free group talk therapy to low income women and adolescents in, in Uganda and Zambia. Uh, we're delighted to welcome Christina Ntulo, who's the Uganda Country Director of Strong Minds, who's going to tell us a bit more about who they are and what they do. Christina, welcome. Uh, do go in and tell us more about, uh, about Strong Minds and what the work is they do. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I want to just thank you for this opportunity. So in Africa, there is a silent epidemic of depression that is affecting up to 66 million women, 85% of Christina, well, we've lost you for the moment. Your mic is could you, Christine, if you can hear me, could you check your mic? We've lost the sound. Okay. Christine, if you can hear me, could you ch check your audio? Uh, sorry about that. Um, technical hitch. Often happens as we're all aware. Uh, I'm going to cut away from Christina for the moment, see if we can get her back a bit later. Uh, for now, just let me introduce the uh, the, the webinar, um, which we've sort of titled Philanthropy for Mental Health, Still Waiting for the Shadow to Lift. Now, in 2016, the World Bank and the World Health Organization launched a report entitled Out of the Shadows, Making Mental Health a Global Development Priority. In spite of this, and in spite of increasing attention during the pandemic, mental health still doesn't get the attention from philanthropy it deserves. And though the SDGs are apparently all embracing, uh, the issue barely registers in their lexicon, and it sort of remains the poor relation of, of health funding generally. Well, many explanations have been given for this, the difficulty of diagnosis, the stigma mental illness can bring with it, the lack of a coordinated response from the medical and funding communities, all of these things play a part. And the special feature of the new alliance highlights these. But it also underlines the wider effects poor mental health can have on both the sufferers and their families and communities. And the fact that, as COVID-19 has shown, 
circumstances can push all of us into situations where our resilience is tested. So in this webinar, we, we want to look at some of the following questions. What is philanthropy currently doing to support better mental health? How can it do more? What are the obstacles to its doing so? And what should its main role be? Should it be funding advocacy? Should it be funding research or treatment? Or should it be funding support for mental well-being generally, or a combination of all these? Uh, we're delighted to have with us today on the panel, Christian Seibert from Swinburne University and Chair of Global Mental Health First Aid, Raj Mariwala from the Mariwala Health Initiative in India, and Daniela Kemba of International Alliance of Mental Health Research Funders and the Graham Book Foundation in Canada. Just before I hand over to them, I'd like to involve everyone in the first of our, our two poll questions. So again, if you, if you cut away to the, uh, the buttons on the side, the right hand side of your screen, if you just click on the polls now, and you should see the first poll question, especially to get a sense of who's in the room today. Um, so uh, could you pick one of the following categories, if you would? Are you A, already funding or otherwise involved in mental health issues? B, would do so if you have more clarity about where and how to intervene? C, I'm not funding or involved, but might if a compelling case could be made or, or some other. Uh, I'll just give you a few seconds to, uh, to answer that. Okay, so let's let's close the poll, shall we? There. Okay, well, it's pretty clear. It's a, almost across the board. Almost overwhelmingly, ninety-five percent are already funding or otherwise involved in mental health issues. So, guys, we're uh, we're, we're preaching to the converted. Um, let me now bring our first of our panelists, who's Christian Seibert, I'm delighted to welcome, who is the guest editor of our um, our special feature on mental health. Christian's an expert on philanthropy in the not-for-profit sector whose work spans the boundaries of policy development, education and research. He's an industry fellow at the Centre for Social Impact at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia, where he teaches and undertakes research in the area of philanthropy and corporate social responsibility. He also has a joint appointment as a policy and regulatory specialist at Philanthropy Australia, which is Australia's peak body for philanthropy. Christian also serves as Chair of Mental Health First Aid Australia, a Melbourne-based organisation with global reach that provides high-quality, evidence-based mental health first aid education to everyone. And over 4 million people have been trained in mental health aid programmes designed by Mental Health First Aid Australia, which are delivered by partner organisations in 24 countries. Christian, welcome. First of all, tell us a little bit about Mental Health First Aid and how it works. Well, thank you um, to Alliance Magazine and, and to you. Andrew for having me um, participate in this event and I do want to also just before I start my remarks just to um, acknowledge the traditional Indigenous owners, the land on which I'm located, the Gunai Kurnai people um, in, in Victoria, this part of Victoria where I am now and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And yes, so um, Thank you for having me. And um, I have a few different hats that I was wearing when I um, when I undertook this role for um, for um, as a guest editor for um, this issue of Alliance magazine. But I suppose I would start off by saying that I'm a person who's passionate about philanthropy, a person who has lived experience of mental illness, as many of us do or know people who who do. And I'm also chair of a mental health charity and um, I have all these different hats and um, I think that was helpful in terms of um, the process of um, uh, co-editing the special feature. And I think in terms of some of my opening remarks, um, I'm not going to assume that everyone sort of has dug into the, um, into the into my article yet in the special feature. So I did want to just kind of highlight some of the, the key points that um, I sort of learned as part of this process because it actually was a learning process for me um and when i was asked to do this and i started doing some research for the special feature and the lead, lead article I, I i wanted it to be something that was somewhat provocative that you know helps to push forward a discussion and i I thought that there needed to be a discussion, but I was also perhaps, you know, waiting to be surprised that maybe I was wrong with some of my assumptions because I, I'd long wondered that when it comes to mental health, we have, say, lots of charities in Australia active in it. In fact, we have foundations funding in it, et cetera. But we didn't have many 
sort of that have a presence across borders, like it wasn't a focus to say overseas aid or um, health charities beyond Australia's borders. And I think it's broadly similar in, in many other countries. And I always wondered why that's the case. And uh, Mental Health First Aid Australia is a little bit of an exception there. And I wondered why that's the case. And then when I was doing research for this, the special feature and reading some of the, the fantastic articles, including by other panelists here today, Danielle and, and Raj, and really it sort of, you know, I'll be honest, it, it did paint a bit of a, um, uh, a frustrating picture. I'll use that term, a frustrating picture. And I think the fact that globally over a billion people are living with mental illness and that 80% of them live in low and middle income countries and that mental illness is the leading um, cause of disability and contributes to millions of premature deaths every year. We've got that, that very striking um, this fact or, or statistic on, on the one hand, but then when the data that we do have on philanthropy shows that it contributes 0.5% of philanthropic health spending. So not 0.5% of philanthropic spending, 0.5% of philanthropic health spending. And then you compare that to the burden of mental illness um, the when it's looked at sort of in, in terms of the global burden of, of um, disease, it's 4.9%. So there is just this disconnect there. I'm not saying that it should be... 5% of philanthropic funding because it's nearly 5% of the global burden of disease, but there is some sort of disconnect there. And I I thought that it's, it's illustrative partly of the disconnect that we do see a bit in society. We do have the SDGs talk about um, uh, mental health. We have, a, a, we do governments, varies, but governments and businesses and others do talk about it. But then we do also see stigma being prevalent and persistent and governments not funding enough. Um, businesses are trying to do better um, and, and there's many positive steps being taken, but not always, it, it's not enough as well. And I think that we have that in philanthropy as well. Like philanthropy, I like to think of it as um, uh, sort of the, the risk capital for social change. And that's not my, my quote, um, it's private wealth for public good. If we've got something that's so so clearly a global problem that needs philanthropy to be involved in terms of providing risk capital for innovation, those sorts of things, and supporting um, programs like Strong Minds and many others in in, in um, low and middle income countries, but it's not hasn't stepped up to that. And I did address a couple of aspects of why that might be the case in my piece, and I won't go into them yet, maybe I'll go into them in the discussion, but I, I do think that this is one of those areas where I think introspection is good and I generally think introspection is good in philanthropy and more broadly and I think we need to look at, yeah, does philanthropy have a mental health problem in the sense that why, why isn't it, hasn't it stepped up as much and what can be done to change that because I think the onus is on philanthropy and change agents, um, uh, people working in mental health charities, people with lived experience to push philanthropy and philanthropy to listen to those people, bring them in to shape decision-making and try and change um, philanthropy's sort of, well, frankly, lacklustre engagement in this area, especially globally. So I'll finish on, on that note, but I really look forward to hearing the other panelists and enter the discussion and, and fantastic to see so many people already commenting and asking questions and introducing yourselves. Thanks again for having me. Great, Christian. Thank you. Um, yeah, I understand your frustration. And uh, you, you mentioned a couple of things there, uh, the frustration and the stigma that often accompanies mental health. And as you, you said, you just let me take this up with you. You, you did ask sort of fairly provocatively in your article, does philanthropy have a mental health problem? Let me just spin that a little bit and, and say, you know, traditionally societies have responded to what this is mental illness by institutionalization, which in a sense is, is closing the door on it, making it invisible, you, close, you shut it away. I mean, do you think that to a certain extent has influenced Philanthropy's attitude towards it? It's got that sort of ambivalence 
but something we'd rather keep in the closet and not think about too much? I think that, you know, we've made, it depends where we are, of course, in the world, and there are people from all different parts of the world here. Like, but I can speak, say, in Australia, we've made so many positive steps as a society when it comes to mental health in recent years and decades. But there still is kind of, um, there is stigma. There is um, suffering in silence. And I know, for example, too, that there is, there's more comfort, say, talking about certain forms of mental illness, um, say, depression or anxiety, but then other forms such as, say, schizophrenia and other forms of um, mental illness, there's less sort of willingness to be open and talk about those things. And I know some talking to some people after this issue was published, actually, in Australia, some foundations, for example, where um, there are people with a foundation who have, like, family members that say might suffer from schizophrenia, for example, and um, they want to do something about it, but they are, they are sensitive about the stigma in society and um, how to get involved and, and sort of how to step out in this area. And I, th I think that it is reflective of the sort of the challenges that we have in society more broadly, but I, I think that it's also something that we need to confront within society, but that's a pretty big ask. But I think we can try and at least start confronting it within philanthropy. And I think a lot of it often comes down to sort of um, organisations saying why they're doing it, you know, stepping out, saying why it's important um, and providing that sort of safe environment or space for others to feel confident to, to do that as well. But I think it's a really important thing that we need to change. Great, thanks. Thanks, Christian. Uh, just before we move on, I'm, I'm sorry if uh, I was hoping to bring uh, Tina and Tula back in again, but she's uh, I think she's left the left the room. I'm sorry for the problems we had there earlier on. But if you, if anybody on the, the call does want to follow up with Strong Minds, uh, I do urge you to sort of check out the website. It's a great organisation. So do have a look at that and, uh, and get in touch with them. That's, that's great. OK, let's move on. Uh, the next uh, next panelist is Raj Mariwala. Raj is director of uh, at Mariwala Health Initiative, as I said earlier, uh, advocacy funding and capacity building organization, organization that focuses on mental health for marginalized communities in India. Currently, Raj serves on the board of the Global Mental Health Action Network and Parcham, a nonprofit that serves adolescent girls through sports. So, delighted to have you with us today, Raj. Please come in and tell us you, how how important do you think concept is context is in, in understanding and working on mental health issues. Um, thanks, Andrew, for having me here. And hello, everyone from across the world. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to say that uh, the assumption that mental health concerns or issues and their impact uh, are standardizable across the globe actually dominates academia, mental health research, and, you know, uh, how do you engage with this assumption, whether in theory or practice, how, how is context important? So I think first, we'd have to sidestep the idea that access to mental health is partly based on language itself. Who has access to labels like depression or anxiety? Or for that matter, um, what's the way in which people explain or experience distress and is it going to mirror the way that it's articulated in diagnostic manuals that are Western, European, and English based? So, you know, uh, this is all well and good, but if I have to draw a picture, I'm going to say that imagine an international aid organization is setting up a relief camp or even a camp in their own country for a geographically inaccessible community. Is mental health going to be accessible if an urban psychiatrist sets up a tent in a village, just like it's done for, say, an eye camp or maybe a heart health camp? Who's going to show up there? And are they going to speak to this person, uh, either in their native language or in, in the Indian context, about uh, their depression or their anxiety? Probably not. OK. And now, because I just love using examples, I'm just I'm going to give you another example. If context wasn't important, this wouldn't happen. And here it is. So between 6% to 48%, I think, of in new Indian mothers experience depression. 
in 2019, more women homemakers died by suicide than Indian farmers. There's also an emerging pattern of maternal suicide in India. Now, many listeners from the West may think, oh, postpartum, we know this. But in India itself, there's also perinatal depression, which is depression that occurs due to pregnancy. Now, if I say, let's look at the context of this, let's look beyond the medical construct of depression. What's the story here? Typically, when women are forced into early marriages, many are compelled to drop out of school. They may also then become entirely financially dependent on their husbands, which affects their decision making power in the household and also makes them more vulnerable to domestic violence and abuse. Importantly, it affects their own sense of agency regarding their sexual and reproductive health and rights. And it is these social determinants or this context, these circumstances that really surround um, you know, how they live, work and grow, and of course, how it affects their physical and mental health. So it's very important uh, to actually look at this context. So, so thanks. Would you tell me a little bit more about what MHI actually does? You... Right. So um, we MHI works on accessible and appropriate mental health services. So, and so thanks. Would you tell me a little bit more about what. Hello. Sorry, we're having the old technical problem. It's my mic that's repeating itself. I'm, I'm oh. switch off now. Right. Um, so I think you said, um, you know, what, what does MHI do? And we focus on accessible and appropriate mental health services and support for marginalized communities by partnering with organizations and programs that foreground community-based mental health support uh, that goes beyond a symptom reduction approach and works towards social inclusion. Uh, now, the emphasis on community and inclusion is important uh, because we believe that heavily individualized solutions are not adequate to address a societal concern like mental health. And of course, programs that don't address the social causes of mental distress will not be effective in a country like India. So the idea is to support a strong focus on community-based grassroots intervention, where services and support are provided not just by experts, but also by trained individuals from within the community themselves. Uh, now, this does a couple of things, which is in addition to foregrounding community voices and participation, this approach also acknowledges how systemic barriers and forms of marginalization specific to context affect an individual's well being. So, for example, currently we work on 32 projects with 27 partners across the country. And by community, we don't mean just rural communities, urban communities, we do work with both, uh, but we also work with farmers, victims of violence, queer trans communities, etc. I think um, the other important aspect of our work is advocacy. Uh, and this is with two particular stakeholders. One is with the government in order to implement rights-based laws and mental health provisions, as well as technical support um, and this could be anything from training judiciary ministries and police on the rights of persons with mental illness, um, as well as to build government helplines and other such services. Uh, the third sector we work with is the establishment of mental health itself. And so we have our own program on queer trans mental health, uh, which is a course for mental health professionals. And we've trained about uh, 400 mental health practitioners in India. Um, to look at affirmative mental health. Um, so that's the work that MHI does. Great, thanks. So interesting. Uh, it, we've we've sort of touched on this or Im implied this, that uh, often this, the, the focus of treatment and dealing with mental health is on the individual. But you, you, it sounds like you're putting it on the community as well, making it a community matter, which is, which is very interesting. You say a little bit more about that. Um, so the again i think the idea is that mental health concerns are a societal issue they are a global issue uh, and if we look at this individually we are not going to solve for it um, and that's typically always the articulation around it right that there are x people with depression there are x people with anxiety and on the other side uh, we have 
X amount of psychiatrists. Now, of course, these numbers uh, highlight the sheer magnitude of the issue. They're also very insufficient to design policies or services to address issues of access and the provision of better mental health, right? Um, if we look at it individually, we may tend to ignore structure and systems and overlook what factors affect awareness of mental health, provision of mental health, efficacy of services, and of course, you know, access. So again, for example, people with mental illness who require mental health care either don't have accessible services in India or those who receive services in India cannot access quality care that is affordable, easily available and acceptable. Now I'm going to make you all listen to another example. So for those Indians in non-major metros, and now these non-major metros means under 12 cities in this country, the presence of mental health is absent at a primary or even a secondary level quite often, and going to the tertiary level, big hospitals can be intimidating. Those who live in rural India have to travel long distances to access mental health care or altogether abandon the idea of treatment due to unaffordable costs. So you have to take a day off, you'd have to pay for your travel, you'd have to pay for your medication. So in such a context, uh, we must look at how to address this as communities and as a rights-based issue. And so that's why we look at it um, in terms of a community-based approach. Thank you. That's so interesting. We'll have more to say about that in the discussion, I'm sure. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to try and bring Tina back in if she's still in the room. Tina, are you there? Are you still on the call? Hi there. Hi there. I am not Tina. <laughs> I am Rasa. I am from Mines. Um, it is 6 a.m. in the morning. I'm East Coast U.S. Um, <laughs> I wanted to fill in for Tina really quickly just to speak a little bit about the phone lines. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being part of this conversation. It's such an important conversation to have. Um, in Africa, there's a silent depression epidemic. 66 million women are suffering from depression. And the World Health Organization says that 85% of them have no access to treatment. Depression is the leading cause of disability among women and adolescents. And women suffer depression at twice the rate as men. Strong Minds provides highly effective, cost-efficient, community-based therapy to the most impoverished women and adolescents in Uganda and Zambia. With over 80% of the women and adolescents we treat becoming depression-free, we see far-reaching impacts for their families and their communities. When a woman is depression-free, her kids go to school more often, her family eats more meals a day, and her household economic productivity increases. To date, we've treated nearly 120,000 individuals. We're striving to scale our model with the audacious goal of ending the depression epidemic in Africa. We've spent the past nine years perfecting our model. We've developed a sustainable scaling strategy and we've trained our team. The only thing holding us back from moving beyond Uganda and Zambia is funding. So I really appreciate this conversation that you're all having. Thank you so much for partnering with us on this and we're really grateful to, to be here. Great, thank you. Uh, are you able to post a link to your website in the, in the chat? Can I will do? absolutely okay. post a link to our website, yes. Great. Great, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, moving on. Uh, the next person I want to bring in is Daniela Kemmer. Daniela is Vice President for Strategy and Initiatives at the Graham Buck Foundation in Canada. <laughs> uh, she's also Executive Director of the International Alliance of Mental Health Research Funders. Her interest is in promoting collaboration and unity within the mental health sector. Uh, with a background in research and research management, she's been instrumental in strengthening ties between the research community and key mental health stakeholders globally. So, Daniela, welcome. Uh, t t tell me a little bit about um, the Alliance, International Alliance for Mental Health Research Funders. How did it come about and, and what's it for? Thank you so much, Andrew. And I'm not sure I can match the uh, awakeness of the the girl just before me. It's also <laughs> 6 a.m., 6.30 for me now, but I, I'll try my best. Um, first of all, I also want to thank the uh, Alliance Magazine for joining, for including me in this effort. Um, I was delighted to see that the Alliance Mag is putting on a, a special issue on mental health, so congratulations to that, and thanks for including me. And um, so the Alliance, um, the, the International Alliance of Mental Health Research Funders was founded about 
10 years ago by the Graham Beck Foundation, a small family foundation based in Montreal, Canada. And um, the, the family really had the vision and ambition to counter fragmentation in the mental health sector. So we are so used to sectors, like especially health sectors being, being organized, uh, having frameworks, and all of that wasn't really there for mental health. So I think the, the bottom line idea was really to bring funders together there where, where some investments at least happen and really start build a sector as opposed to just have like uh, investments uh, being done in a, in a discoordinated fashion. And um, so the way it started is that this uh, it was really just a handful of funders uh, that got together and started talking quite informally, actually, and really thought together about what what can we do to increase the impact of the, the research investments, at least. And um, it has become now really a, a place for coordinating and convening um, the, the, the research side of things to really help build that sector and uh, to also build a, a global funders community, which is usually important when you try to, to, to drive a, a topic. What, what's the importance of, of, of research for you? Where, where particularly research? Well, I think that's, the, and I'm really glad you asked that because I, in these kind of forums, it's rare that you, you get the opportunity to, to talk about research. And maybe I should, before I get, I get into that, I should also mention that I think we all know, I mean, from, from your initial poll, I understand that we're really, I'm preaching here to convert it. So I'm not, I, I don't need to make the case here for, for mental health and why it's important to, to pay attention to it. But I think one of the things that's really important to realize is that there is not a single country or a single resource that that's sufficient or will be able to tackle or address all the mental health challenges that we currently face in the world. So I think bringing organizations together, funders together is extremely important to 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 move the needle in the field. And um, it's also important when we think of, of uh, interventions or what we do, um, I mean, there, there are some solutions that, that are long term and where we also need to make progress. I mean, if you think about existing interventions and a lot of, of people that suffer, especially from severe mental illness, I mean, they, they depend on, on drugs, on, on medical treatments. And usually, I mean, if we think about what's available nowadays, most of these t treatments, they honestly, they've been around for decades and there hasn't been a whole lot of innovation in the field. And it's important to, to not forget about that. Um, so bringing funders together there is it's really important to strike a balance between those long-term ambitions where we really try to eventually get new treatments into the sector and and I'm really also pointing like we will need pharmacological interventions so that's one thing but I think what has been forgotten for a long time is that um, a lot of the research investments have been really focusing on this and so we haven't seen um, any effective interventions or um, new care models even for a long time that really address more of the short, short medium term uh, solutions for, for people that currently suffer from mental health challenges. And I think it's very important that research turns to that, to that aspect as well. So this is just making the case in general for, for the research. But then I think we also um, have to agree that the field has really been failing to help the mentally ill effectively. I mean, I think it was pointed out like now here already by my, my two co-panelists, I mean, how 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 big the, the problems are. And um, Christian like pointed out in the beginning, like that there are so many people are suffering from this, yet there's so few solutions out there that we're currently using. And um, there, there are very few effective treatments, interventions, medical advantage, advances, as I said, are very few. And social innovations haven't been a whole lot and either. And all those things need research. So uh, to provide adequate support in the long term, research is absolutely critical. And even if I think about all the, the, the efforts in the field around advocacy, and I think that the field has made tremendous progress in the last few years, especially in the last five years, I would say, to really advocate for the cause. I mean, we, we now hear about mental health in so many instances, whereas like, I don't know, like 
more than than 10 years ago there was really nobody was talking about this i i would say that has changed but i think how we are all very painfully aware of that the funding hasn't really caught up with that i mean the narrative is starting to to evolve but there hasn't been more funding in the sector really and that needs to change eventually and um well, I think one of the the keys to that is actually research, and maybe I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm talking about why why funding research is so critical is that I think we don't really use uh, or we we don't use what we have. So um, so there's a la large gap between what we know and what we do. So effective interventions are often used in other fields to attract more funding. I mean, if you tell philanthropists here, there is, uh, we have a number of tools out there that work. If you give us more money, we'll create more of that. Um, we really don't do, we don't approach the field this way. So we, we talk a lot about the burden um, that almost everybody's affected, but we don't really tell the stories of, what works, what is effective. And I think if we see what's being done in other fields, the mental health field would greatly benefit from that because there are a few interventions that do work. There are solutions out there that work, but we don't seem to use them in our narrative very well. So I think research or the the, the evidence can, can help that a whole lot. Um, then, also, research isn't currently very well embedded in the, the mental health ecosystem. So if we can really, if we find a way to clearly point to solutions, I think the messages will resonate a whole lot more with people that invest in the sector. I mean, if there isn't any hope to creating like solutions where the investments will actually help further those solutions, then it's very difficult to really incentivize people to, to invest in the sector. And I think we, we just gotta, gotta get better at that. And um, so, I mean, that's something I stress all the time is that we, we need to stop thinking about, so this is research, this is advocacy, here's the service, the service delivery. I think we all need to work together to, to move the sector as a whole. So we, we need to find ways of building a community where, where we all find our, our place to, to really build the sector up that it can compete or, or can be at par with, with, with other sectors. And um, research will certainly also be useful to help building this overarching framework that we all need to relate to, to find our, our niche and our space where we can, like within our stakeholder communities, contribute to that sector. Um, there is... Uh, when we think about advocacy, I mean, advocacy for parity, for example, between mental health and physical health, uh, something very important. Um, there's also people with lived experience are now becoming very active to, to advocate for, for paying attention to mental health, basically countering the stigma. Um, but I, I think all those efforts, they often neglect the, the evidence piece in the efforts. I mean, it, it would, a lot of those stories would, would greatly benefit from pointing to, hey, look, this works. Why don't we do more of this? Like to really get a, a coherent story going. And I think here research can really help a whole lot. And then obviously why there isn't more, more funding. So it's not, uh, it's not clear how to move the needle either, right? I mean, I think we, we all realize uh, th there are almost endless determinants of mental health. So where do we actually start? So where, where what do we do? I mean, philanthropists, they, they hear from, 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 like I just talked about, like pharmacological interventions um, or other, other interventions. And uh, Raj talked about community-based services or like the, the role of community, the context dependency. Um, then we, we hear more and more about the relation of climate change and mental health. So it is so complex that I think it's very tricky for, for investors to really find their, their way to to understand how it all fits together. And I do think um, 
this is something where we, we need to come together as a community to build this this framework mm -hmm. where we have very clear messaging where organizations understand their roles philanthropists understand their roles government understands their roles so where it's really much more clearly defined also articulating ambitions like with timelines there's a lot of advocacy for for more mental health in general but becoming very concrete saying so this are this is what we're trying to do within this this time frame to really set set high ambitions and have something quite tangible quite clear to to work towards i think would would really benefit the field to become less less blurred i think for for a lot of, of philanthropists that are trying to, to just find their place in this in the sector um so this is i think this is why what why i would point the the emphasis so let's work together and let's 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 build up a sector that that makes sense to everybody who wants to play a role in it, who wants to contribute to that. Because I think right now it's still very confusing how to do that effectively, and I think we see that in in the lack of of investments like to, to into mental health and related causes. Great, thank you. And it sounds like research is really the sort of the underpinning to all of it, really, in lots of ways, because and that, that would also help to point people in the right direction. So you talked about this, this sort of complexity and people not knowing basically where to get hold. Again, research would, would help that, presumably, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah. Uh... I mean, research alone is not going to do much. And I think we've seen this. Uh, I mean, well, as I said in the beginning, there hasn't been a whole lot of, of uh, innovation uh, making it into the sector where we can really say, oh, yeah, their research made it made a great difference. But I think it's also due to the disconnect between what's happening on the ground and research really uh working in isolation so these are often disparate communities that don't necessarily connect very well and and we're at the alliance we're certainly trying to to bring those communities together i mean we are we're, we're stakeholders in the mental health sector we all want to move the needle in the sector but we need to to work together to do that and i i think there's there's a lot of room for improvement still um I'm quite encouraged uh, by the, the growing community. Um, we, we have become much better talking to each other. I think it's now uh, we've made a lot of progress and that's really thanks to, to all these uh, fantastic colleagues that, that work on the advocacy piece that now on, on, on different levels, it's, we pay attention to mental health much more than before. I mean, it, it, it's not a taboo anymore, at least in, in, in most high income countries like it's openly more openly spoken about than than what it used to do but there's still we still have a long way to go if we really want to what a first of all attract more funding to the sector and really make sure that we create new solutions that that make it out there and that that will help people ultimately and um where philanthropists can also feel okay i i want to invest in this because i know i'll make it i make i will make a difference with my investment and i think that's that's what it comes down to when we we think about the increased engagement of the the philanthropic sector great thank you danielle uh time's running away with that i'm aware so i want to move very quickly through the second poll question to get, get on to the audience questions so if you look at the uh if you look at the poll section again, the right hand side of your screen, the second question is, where do you think funders should concentrate their attention? Uh, should it be in treatment? Should it be research? Should it be increasing public awareness? Should it be advocacy with policymakers? Or should it be some other category? Uh, should we want to take a few seconds just to give your two penneth on that? Okay, I'm going to close the Right, so can we close the poll now, please? Great, so it's a pretty good split, actually. Uh, treatments down there at zero, that's interesting. Research, perhaps thanks to Daniela's presentation, is up at 20. Increasing public awareness and advocacy are both high on 30%, and lots of other suggestions too, which we unfortunately don't have time to go into. Great, thank you very much. Uh, right, let's go to some of the audience questions, if we can. Let me bring in the first one. Uh, this first one here is from someone called Aruna Rahman. To funders who work in diverse linguistic settings, 
How do you identify and support localised initiatives that are relevant but might not be on the radar of the English-speaking world of philanthropy, mental health philanthropy? Okay. Um, Christiane, could I bring you in on that? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. And I, I, I'm not one of those those funders, but I suppose I, I would like to respond by saying that when I was thinking about this special feature, I was very mindful that we don't, and this also goes to what Raj was saying, that we don't um, just, you know, assume that Western approaches to mental health work all around the world and that in the context of mental health and how it's addressed in the special feature, but I think more broadly this is relevant, that we don't have an approach that, well, in effect, is kind of like a colonial-style approach where we have, you know, Western conceptions of mental health and, and what approaches work or don't work and just assume that it works everywhere else in any other community. And, I mean, even in my own... Um, I'm Polish Australian, I was born in Poland, and I know the difference in terms of attitudes to mental health in, say, Poland and the Polish community and in Australia and, and the Australian community is so different. And that again goes to sort of Raj's point about how context is so important. And I think that it's perhaps an area too where there might be some reluctance from philanthropy to engage sometimes too, perhaps, but it needs to be confronted because Mental health is relational. It's impacted by cultural and other factors, and it can perhaps therefore be more complex in some ways in terms of engaging in other countries and cultures um, because of that. But I think that it's um, important to think about that and, and how that can be um, addressed and how, yeah, the, the role of community leadership and the leadership of people with lived experience in those communities wherever they are in the world rather than people sort of that are divorced from those communities. Right. Raj, I'd love to get your take on this. This is right in your sort of home park, really, in lots of ways. What, what's, what's your view? Sure. So, um, you know, MHI does, in fact, um, fund and work with partners um, across multiple languages. Um, and I think one of the answers is look at the community-based organization. Um, are they you know, enmeshed in the community? Are they part of the community that they work with? Um, are they led uh, by someone from that very community? Um, and it's very important to see that, you know, they know the context, they're part of the social fabric of the community. So that's, that's one thing. And um, I would say the second thing um, is really to look at whether they would understand or be able to work with what one would call the cultural idioms of distress. So, you know, the ways of communicating emotional suffering that don't refer necessarily to labels such as depression or anxiety, and yet provide a way to talk about personal or social concerns. Um, so, for example, there's a project, a community-based project that we fund and partner on that is across 560 villages in a district. Um, and the community workers are from there. And so similarly, one would look at ensuring that there is a real connect with the community because really they may not have access to English language, but as long as there is a connection to a social fabric as well as a linkage to maybe an English speaking psychiatrist for those who need it, um, that's the sort of stuff I would look at because these are the organizations really that will have the power to change the mental health landscape um, in the coming years. Great, thank you. Daniela, anything to add to that? Before we move on? Yeah, I think I think the, the context dependency is actually it's it's very specific to the mental health sector, which is um, which makes it certainly very tricky for for philanthropists to find their way especially if we think about philanthropists that would want to invest internationally i mean i honestly i can't think of any other sector that's so context dependent and uh, especially when we think across high low and middle income countries so what will we just live through i mean or we've still are living through a pandemic where really that the the solution was let's find this vaccine let's do the well it can be basically done anywhere in the world and then it can be dis distributed right to anywhere in the world it, it becomes almost like a logistical 
issue only. Whereas now with mental health, I mean, the complexity of the, 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 the socio-cultural context is certainly, um, is certainly a critical piece of, of uh, the difficulty to, to really find uh, solutions that can also be transferred elsewhere and uh, to, to build that sector where, where really organizations relate to and think, oh yeah, okay, I, I understand what's needed here. I, I, I wanna contribute. So it, it stays local in, in a way so we we have to find a way of, of bridging that like to to make sure the investment can come from from different parts of the world i mean unfortunately we don't have equal distribution of, of resources across the world so it's just a reality we got to work with but so how can we how can we we create that that understanding and that that connection to so many places in the world that where this, the context is so critical to making a difference. Great, thank you. We've got an interesting question here from uh, Empire Foundation, who were also contributors to the special feature. Uh, and it's from David Crook, who's at the, the, the Emerging Markets Foundation, Empire. Uh, it says, in 2016, Empire decided to reorient its entire South Africa grant making and programming focus to use mental well-being because we realized how fundamental it is to supporting progress against our mission level goals for youth livelihoods and education. So how can we encourage or incentivize more funders to integrate mental well-being within their strategies and dedicate resources to community led interventions? So that's funders who aren't necessarily frontline mental health funders, but should be taking this into account. Raj, any views on that? Um, yes, actually, that's one of my favorite uh, kind of soapbox <laughs> topics. Because, um, Very good. I have, I have a personal grouse with the fact that mental health has remained invisible or implicit in development paradigms. And when, in fact, mental health heavily influences at least 10 of the 17 sustainable development goals. And it is really a prerequisite to SDGs 1 through 5. Um, and that's simply because, you know, poor mental health is both a cause and consequence of poverty, compromised education, gender inequality, physical ill health, violence, and other such global challenges. So I always like to turn this around and ask whether you can afford to ignore the mental health component in your work on livelihoods, physical health, education, or housing. And I'm going to say that you should not. Uh, and I'll just pick up one example. I know that Danielle mentioned climate change. And it's really staggering that um, the true costs of climate change on mental health and emotional well being remain largely unquantified in both policy and practice. Now, this is wild, considering that the number of cases of psychological trauma arising from a climate disaster exceeds physical injury cases by 40 to 1. Um, and just as another example, climate change may have contributed to the suicides of nearly 60,000 Indian farmers and farm workers over the past three decades. Um, so it's very clear that uh, mental health cannot be looked at uh, in a silo or in you know, the very specific, your meat and potatoes, just mental health. Yeah, that's great. Christian, Daniela, any, anything to add to that? I think it's one of those areas where I think when we fund in a particular cause area, um, there can be in, in, we are some, there's sometimes an encouragement to use particular lenses to um, overlay our funding approaches in philanthropy. And I think that that's a good thing, but then there can also be a sort of sense of being overwhelmed by which lenses we need to use, et cetera. But I think that looking at an issue from different perspectives is what we should do in any realm of activity, including in philanthropy. And I think some of those examples that Raj gave, you know, were excellent examples of where you can look at particular issues, whether it's climate change or other issues from different perspectives, and you get then insights around, um, you know, the mental health, say, lens of that issue. And I think that it will reveal complexity, and that can be daunting. But I think that it can then also show that some of our kind of instinctive reactions to certain um, issues can mean that we overlook other um, 
sort of potential, like the example around sort of you know, trauma with, with climate change, for example, and disasters, etc. I think it's, um, yeah, looking at from different perspectives. I, th I think what came out very strongly from the, the articles in the Alliance special feature was that you know, mental health is about a lot more than simple whether you're mentally ill or mentally well or not, it, you know, the, the whole host of it. It's a development question, I think, as, as Raj pointed out in her article. Um, let me just move on, to, because we're nearly out of time. Let me just move on to one final question, if I can. It's from uh, BJ Rajkumar. Uh, and it's, how do you think we could encourage non-pharmaceutical-based researchers that address the root causes of mental illness against the symptoms? Danielle, that's got your name on it. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I think I, I said already that we're really trying to, to focus uh, the research efforts also now on the, the short to medium term solutions to really come up with, with uh, solutions that, that help people like in, in, in a relatively short term. And that would not be um, pharmacological based intervention. So for sure, um, I have to say, I think what we do with the alliance is actually exactly that, that we bring the funders together to really make, like bring the conversation around the importance of doing that. Because so for a long time, I think the funders have thought about the issues and their strategies and what they fund, where they fund in the spectrum. If we think of basic biomedical research and and really the, the, the applied end of things, um, They've been often alone making those decisions where they, their their organizations uh, go and fund, and by bringing the community together, really addressing the topic more from a from a, a sector perspective, it's actually easier, I think, for for organizations funders to really understand where the gaps are, and uh, we, we need to understand that we have huge gaps that that need like pressing, addressing, and uh, by by bringing the community together, uh, that, that's one thing, the funders. We also, um, uh, we actually do a first baseline of, of uh, how we fund research, mental health research currently. So when we, we, uh, we published our, our study um, now a bit more than a year ago, really a, a first baseline, our, our, how much is currently invested into mental health research. It's funny, we've been making, we've been advocating for more funding for a long, long time without actually knowing how much is currently spent on mental health research and, and how it's spent. And when you look at, at the report and the study, um, you'll see that we've really been investing for a long time in the, in the basic uh, end of the spectrum. So there's mm. certainly a lot to do at the at the, the the other end of the spectrum, and so I think taking those those numbers into account, um, it's 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 uh, pretty obvious that we we need to 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 do more on the uh, like the, the immediate to short term. Right. I'm sorry to say that we're almost out of time. Um, I'm going to come to each of you, if I may, just for a quick sort of last reflection. Um, Good question still coming in, which I'm sorry we're not going to be able to get to. Uh, but Christian, can I just come to you for your your, your final sum, summing up? What do you take from this? Is, is there anything that's, that's kind of really reinforced for you this session? Yeah, well, I think that the the importance of context and community based approaches is, is you know something that came across in the issue itself and in this in the feature and and in this um, discussion. And I think that. Um, that's a real sort of um, important point um, that I've I've been you know thinking about. But I also one thing I suppose I'm really keen to see is that you know the, the discussion that this special feature sort of started that it continues and hopefully um, diffuses more broadly and that we get some um, some tangible sort of shifts and changes and highlights of good practice and less good practice and um, examples of practice that isn't as good, but yeah, that we get some positive change and, and debate, yeah. Raj, what, what's your takeaway from this, if, if you have one? Um, well, based on, I, I think, the questions and the chat, uh, I think the stuff that should inform funding on mental health, because, I mean, there's no doubt that it's inadequate, but there should be some lessons from activist movements that should inform mental health philanthropy. And that is nothing about us without us. 
any expert interventions should be situated alongside peer groups, networks, and communities. And in mental health, we must look at widening our ambit and breaking the silo of working on services from just a mental health lens um, to actually support people and collective movements, demand freedom from violence, from food insecurity, to provision of social safety nets, labor rights, LGBTQI rights, and human rights. Brilliant. That's a great, uh, a great last minute. <laughs> Thanks, Raj. Danielle, you, Danielle, you have the last word. So I think, um, I think a comprehensive approach is absolutely critical if we, if we want to move the needle here. And uh, we also need to, to make efforts to harmonize like across the sector. And uh, like right now, it's very difficult to measure the effectiveness of the tools we have, of the, 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 the interventions we have. So this requires research. So I'm, again, I make the case for research, of course. Um, one point related to that I want to make and it's often neglected and I, I'm sure you, you all heard that it's often said there's not sufficient data especially from low and middle income countries like we don't have any evidence from those places and it, it tends to, to people often tend to believe that there's nothing happening there and I would argue that's actually not true I would argue that there is a lot happening there we're just not measuring it because the way we, we measure evidence right now um, from those parts of the world, it doesn't make it into our system, into our measurement system, research systems. And I would really encourage like all of us, and I'm talking to, to the funders and research funders communities as well, is that we focus on real world evidence going forward. I mean, it is really important to collect the evidence and not to try to uh, bring like those high income country focused research systems that we've been working with for decades, try to kind of fit whatever happens in other parts of the world into that system, but really revisit the way we we look at evidence, how we think about evidence, and think about those th th the real world context, and try to find a good way of measuring that. And I'm I'm certain we'll get a whole lot of data from all the innovation solutions that are currently created in the community settings, community based in in many parts of the world, and they will then finally make it into the the, the world of data. Let's say that. <laughs> And it will be, be part of that evidence that we that we all use and should be using to to make our decisions. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, it's time for me to wrap up now. Uh, just before I do, can I remind you all of our special offers today? Um, if you want to take up the twenty percent discount offer, go to the uh, go to the offers button on on the the right hand side of the, the window before you leave the site. And if you want to get the uh, the feminist philanthropy issue free uh, there'll be a link in the follow-up email okay well thanks to all of our panelists who've been wonderful uh, thanks to all of you for for taking part i'm aware that if, you, if you're trying to straddle the world it's not easy because of time zones but uh, um and thanks to the alliance team particularly Anne marie mcqueen who's produced today's event and uh, and all of you so i hope you've enjoyed the discussion you've something to take away from it and we look forward to seeing you all again at some future session in the meantime Thanks again to all of all of you and especially to our panelists. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>